Playoff soccer is here. See which big name crashed out in the first round. Stunning news for one MLS team just a day after the commissioner gets a new deal. And the man who says he can explain stoppage time joins us in studio. Soccer Central starts now. Well, the USL Pro, Pro playoffs are underway, and boy, did they start off with a bang. The big story, could Orlando City continue its dominant and record-breaking season with a second straight championship, effectively riding off into the sunset as the team leaves the third division to join MLS next year? Standing in the way of the Lions, the Harrisburg City Islanders and the eight seed was not about to roll over. Orlando saw plenty of the ball in the first half, but couldn't do anything with it and it would cost them. 40th minute, Islanders on the counter. Jamil Hardware springs Antoine Hoppano, who fires past Carl Wozniacki, ends a 309-minute shutout streak for the Orlando keeper, and the Islanders lead 1-0. City would get chances to equalize, and the best chance came here in the 79th minute. Dennis Chin somehow puts the wide-open header over the bar. Orlando can't get the equalizer, and the Harrisburg City Islanders stun the Lions. It's Orlando's first home loss in 19 games, and it ends their season. So we had one of the top seeds down. Could the LA Galaxy 2 avoid a similar upset against the Rochester Rhinos? It looked good for the underdogs early. Alex Dixon here finding J.C. Banks. He hammers his shot off the crossbar and in. Rochester jumping out to the early lead. It wouldn't last, though. Five minutes later, Jamie Villarreal shot hits a Rochester player in the arm. The referee points to the spot, and Chandler Hoffman, he's been playing well down the stretch, steps up to bury the PK and level the game. Fast forward to the second half now. Hoffman getting free down the left. His cross in beats everybody, finds Charlie Rugg for the tap-in. Los Dos leads 2-1. Galaxy 2, though, would play most of the second half down a man after a second yellow card to Captain Rafael Garcia, but Brian Perk picked up the slack. Right here, getting down to push away Banks' free kick in stoppage time. Los Dos hold on for the 2-1 victory. While the Richmond Kickers and the two-seed Sacramento Republic are your other quarterfinal winners, that sets up a mouth-watering semifinal. LA Galaxy 2 takes on Sacramento in a new version of the Cali Classico, and we get another regional battle on the other side of the bracket when Harrisburg City Islanders meet Richmond. Cannot wait for those games. One thing to note here, the championship game will be played in California. The two Cali teams are the highest seeds still in the playoffs. Well, it's not quite playoff time in MLS yet, but we're getting closer. Now, the regular season is designed to be forgiving, so it's not often we get games like we did this weekend and it doesn't get any better than the matchup we started with on Friday night. Seattle, Real Salt Lake, a true rivalry, and two of the teams still in the hunt for the supporters' shield. Well, Sounders with the Open Cup final to play on Tuesday, but you wouldn't know it from the lineup. Both teams rolling out 11s will probably see come playoff time. Seattle got off to a good start in this game, but it was RSL that opened the scoring. Luke Mulholland here on the right wing is going to find some space. And you might want to mark Javier Morales. Seattle apparently didn't get that memo. one nothing to the Claret and Cobalt. Well, Nick Romano was a beast against the Czech Republic. A beast in this game, but there's no stopping this. Lamar Nagel with the heat-seeking missile into the top corner. And that would put the Sounders level at one. We talked about not giving Morales space. Here's a couple of more guys you don't want to give any space to on the Sounders side. Martins, the nice little flick to Dempsey. He's going to return the favor with the defense splitting ball. And Martins, the little scoop finish over Armando. Sounders come roaring back to take the lead. And we're not even close to done because right after halftime, Jao Plata is shot. Going to deflect off Ozzy Alonso, deflect off the post and in. Back on level terms again. It would get crazier. 68th minute here after we watch Plata celebrate his goal in the corner. We'll go to the 68th minute. Ball over the top for Obafemi Martins. Nat Borcher's going to drag him down just outside of the box. Not a PK, but it is a straight red card. No arguments from RSL. Borchers does save the goal, though. And for a while, it looked like that was going to be enough to preserve the draw. RSL doing plenty of the gamesmanship down the line, staying down after some fouls, 
making a lengthy sub here with Plata. They probably wish they had just played it out because all that time wasting leads to five minutes of stoppage time and the Sounders took advantage of every second. Correal holding except for Sabarillo playing up higher. Into the box. Several players miss it. Rose! Go! Seattle leads! Andy Rose at the death. His third goal in the last two games. Seattle moves four points clear of the Galaxy in the shield race and eight points clear of RSL. Well, Dempsey and Martins have been an incredible strike partnership. They got a goal in that game, and they've accounted for 24 goals and 16 assists this season. I want to see how that stacks up against the two of the other dynamic duos in the league. Robbie Keane and Giassi Zardes have combined for 27 goals and 16 assists, and Thierry Henry and league-leading scorer Bradley Wright Phillips, they racked up 30 goals and 13 assists. Now to go a little more next level, I looked at how many times each of those partnerships combined directly for a goal, meaning one scored off the other's assist. Now Dempsey and Martins have hooked up six times, including last night. That's three better than Keenan Zardes, but leading the pack, Henri and BWP. Henri has assist, assisted on eight of Wright Phillips' 21 goals. Now one of those assists was credited after Henri drew a penalty that was scored by Wright Phillips. While well, FC Dallas doesn't really have an attacking duo, Oscar's Pereja, Oscar Pereja's team is just loaded with attacking talent, period. Blas Perez, Fabian Castillo, Tesh Oekendele, the list goes on. Dallas taking on the Whitecaps Saturday night. That's a team that also has a good group of attackers, but it's a group that has not been scoring. Even so, Vancouver clinging to the last playoff spot in the Western Conference could really use a win to put some distance between themselves and the Portland Timbers. And there were some great goals this week, but I'm going to spoil it for you. The goal of the week winner is coming out of this game. Here's why. Are you kidding me, Blas Perez? Jeremiah O'Shan on Twitter called it a run of play. Olympico pretty much says everything you need to know about that goal. Caps probably feeling hard done, but this will make it better. Eric Hurtado, the first time volley, just the third goal in six games for the Caps. But this night would belong to Perez. Right place, right time here. Easy finish with David Ostad out of position. Dallas gets the 2-1 win. So Vancouver stays at 37 points, giving the Portland Timbers a chance to jump back into the playoff places. All they had to be the, do was beat the Colorado Rapids, losers of seven straight. Easy, right? Well, nothing's ever easy when it comes to the Portland defense. Timbers get on the board first here. Fernando Adi, the clever little layoff, and Diego Valeri, another terrific season from him. He powers at home. That lead would not last long, though. Liam Ridgewell called for the handball in the box. Dylan Powers is going to send Ricketts the wrong way, and we are tied at one. It would get worse for the Timbers. Mark Birch floats it to the back post here, and Deshaun Brown getting up to head home. That is not an easy goal to score, people. Take a look at it again. You know, Caleb Porter and his team chasing the game. He's going to throw on Gaston Fernandez. The sub would deliver, showing good strength here, and a nice finishing touch to tie the game. Timbers rescue a point, but miss the chance to jump the Whitecaps, still one point outside of the playoff places. Well, switching conferences now, but not situations. Another matchup with huge playoff implications in the Eastern Conference, the New York Red Bulls visiting the Philadelphia Union. New York one point ahead of Philly in the table. Union has been surging, winners of three straight. Game delayed over an hour because of heavy rain, but Ethan White can't blame the bad field on this. Blatant foul in the box, drags down Louis Andula, and Louis Andula himself would step up and put the spot kick away, 1-0 Red Bull. So Zach McMath, he's having a good season, but he's going to want this one back. Thierry Henry skips it off the wet turf, makes it 2-0. Union would respond, though. Pedro Ribeiro does a nice job to get on the end of this cross and turn it home. Philly cuts it to 2-1. We head to the second half. The referee giveth. The referee taketh away. Penalty called on Ibrahim Sakaya. Sebastian Latou continues his great season. The Union managed the draw. 2-2 still level on points with fifth place Columbus, but behind on goal differential. Well, coming up after the break, we're going to get into some of the more serious side of MLS that we heard about this week. And a little later in the show, the man who says he can explain stoppage time, you will not want to miss that. Make sure to stick around. 
Uh, Chivas USA got blown out 4 nothing Friday night by Sporting Kansas City, but that was nothing compared to the bombshell dropped the same night by Sports Illustrated's Brian Strauss. Strauss is reporting multiple sources have told him Chivas will not play next season and possibly the season after that while the GOATs go through a rebrand. rebrand excuse me. Now, all year we've known the league is trying to find a new owner, but I don't think anyone thought having the team sit out for a year or two was a possibility. Now, this is a bad situation. There's no denying that. But let's think about this logically. Chivas needs a rebrand. It's important to get that rebrand right. Now, shutting down a team is not a great look for MLS, but would playing through those two years really help while the transition is going on? A hastily done rebrand with no advertising, no buildup, isn't going to sell tickets, not going to build a fan base. And there's nowhere to play on short notice except the StubHub Center. That's known as the LA Galaxy Stadium, and it's one of the reasons Chivas doesn't have its, identity, its own identity now. Now, I feel for the Chivas fans. I really do. But the harsh reality is there just aren't enough of them to make it worth trying to keep this team going through the rebrand. Sounds harsh, but if the cost of getting a new and healthy team in LA is to lose the current group of Chivas USA fans, Unfortunately, that's a good trade-off business-wise for the league. Now, make no mistake, this is a failure for MLS. It's arguably the biggest failure since actually having to fold two teams in 2002. That's an interesting uh, juxtaposition. The timing is interesting because it comes a day after MLS announced Don Garber has signed a five-year contract that will keep him as commissioner of the league until 2018. And MLS has mostly flourished under Garber, and he's holding to his top league by 2022 mantra, now, he was at the helm in 2002 when the league almost failed after contracting to 10 teams, but he was the guy who managed to get MLS out of trouble, and now he's the reason the league will have more than 20 teams next year. But this has to be his biggest challenge since that 2002 contraction. How he handles the Chivas USA situation probably won't come to define his career as MLS commissioner, but there are more people watching this time around, and it's important that he gets LA2 right. Well, after the break, stick around because... Like I've been telling you all show, the man who says he can explain stoppage time, he will be here in studio to talk about referee bias. Maybe we'll figure out why uh, Jeff Kassar wasn't too happy with those, stop, those five minutes awarded to the Sounders. Stick around. Can they do something here? It's Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh, it's a great cross, and it is an equalizer from Varela. USA denied. Right at the death. Well, unfortunately, we all remember that goal. The <laughs> USA getting the tie against Portugal. Perhaps they, they win that game. Maybe they get a better matchup in the next round. But the big story in that game, the stoppage time. And the ref actually came out and said after the game, he added on another minute because Graham Zussi was subbed in. And that's, of course, when Portugal scored. And joining me now is a man who thinks he can explain how stoppage time is awarded. Maybe he's shed some light on that. Nick Watanabe, he's got a PhD from the University of Illinois. My good friend, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You've done some interesting research here on referee bias and how stoppage time is awarded. So how did you come up with this idea initially? Well, there's actually a whole line of research that looks at referee bias, whether it's giving a red card, a yellow card, awarding a penalty, or extra time. But what happened was I was at a conference and I went to a presentation. I asked what I thought was going to be a simple and stupid question was, how come none of these uh, presentations about extra time have actually looked at the amount of uh, injuries and fouls that are happening within a match? And someone said, who was actually rather high up in our world, <laughs> said, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't you do that? <laughs> so pretty soon I found myself back at home and here I was trying to figure out how to gather the data to go about trying to find out you know, how many fouls and injuries happen in a match so we can look at whether it affects extra time at the end of the match. And how did, walk us through really quickly, how did you go about gathering that data? So myself and uh, another student, we actually went in and we looked at every single instance in every Premier League match over the last two seasons. So we were looking at every time there was a foul, injury, substitution, goal scored, free kick taken, everything was recorded, every single instance, but uh, just for the second half, because we really want to understand the second half as leading into determining that extra time the referee gives, right? So if, you know, he says, I gave time for Graham Susie's substitution, it's because that happened the second half, not in the first half. And you did this for the Premier League, is that correct? Yes, we did this for every team, for every match, uh, every single instance of the Premier League. It was a 
daunting data collection that had two people sitting a lot of time in front of computers looking at these match data, but we gathered the whole thing and we put it into a large panel data set that was, uh, allows us to run results to look at how we can understand extra time within soccer. Before we get to the good stuff, how it's actually worded, we got to also understand some stuff you controlled for uh, in the experiment. So yes. the thing, uh, the score had to be two goals or less differential, right? And also you looked at kind of nationalistic bias. Yes. So we actually have two models. The first model looks at uh, situations where the goal differential is two goals or less. And then our other models, the situation where there's one goal or less. Um, so that also includes ties. And there is slight differences in there. We looked at nationalistic bias because it's been theorized and some research has shown, for example, at international matches that uh, the bias is based on, you know, where the composition of the team is and who the referee is. In our case, I think it wasn't really an important factor and I think that's partly because we see a changing demographic in the Premier League where there are so many international players on all the teams. And you actually, now to get to that good stuff, you actually did find some Pretty significant results. Yeah, I was, I was, I wasn't say I was fully surprised by the results, but I think it was rather interesting. We see that scoring goals in the second half gives you more time, but actually goals in extra time. So in that extra amount of period, will give you even more time. So a referee will give you more time if you score a goal really late in the match. Uh, substitutions obviously had the mo not the most, but was another significant factor, as was injuries. Um, so, and fouls, right? So it would seem to be that, for example, fouls, there's, you know, a very, you know, small amount of time you can get from a foul, and a foul takes a lot of time for a person to get back up. So it actually makes sense to actually foul people a lot. And then I think the most important thing we see is actually the goal differential. So with the goal differential, it was, it was significant on the two goal situation and slightly significant in the one goal differential situation, which actually means that home teams were getting more extra time when they needed to score goals and less extra time when they actually needed to defend. So in other words, referees were giving advantageous situations to home teams. So lots of people love to look, especially in the Premier League, and think Manchester United gets these, these advantages. They get ridiculous amounts of stoppage time. So what you're saying is when they're at home, maybe that's true, but that's not necessarily true across the board. That is correct. Um, and we actually controlled with special effects for the ref each referee for every team, uh, both home and for away. And Manchester United was not significant in any model. In fact, most of the teams were not significant at all. So it's not actually that any specific team gets more time, but that the team that's at home will get the better situation. Manchester United, we naturally watch more probably because they're an exciting team. So it actually would make sense that we think they get more time where across the league we're actually getting more time. And the other thing I want to go back to really quick is the foul situation because I yes. think that's really, really interesting. So what you're saying is the U.S. is trying to bird time in this, this game we saw in the World Cup game by making the sub. But what they actually should have been doing is, is hacking Portugal every time they got the ball. Is that what your <clears throat> research is saying? Well, I think there's actually a couple things they could have done. You know, first is hacking Portugal because a referee from our research adds on maybe two or three seconds for a foul where it would take you at least 10, 15 seconds to actually restart. So if you think about it, not any dangerous foul or anything that's going to give them a free kick, but if you can just foul them, you know, around the halfway line or, you know, send the ball deep, foul them on their other end, the goalie has to run up, kick the ball, try to send it long forward, that's going to take a lot of time. So that helps out. Substitutions are helpful. Uh, it's curious that the referee says he gave one minute because our results say that referees tend to give about 30 seconds for a substitution. So he may have watched his watch and saw how long it took Graham Zussi to walk off. I think uh, my own personal opinion, I've told this to you before, is you always substitute the captain unless he's the goalkeeper because he has to take off the armband, he has to go to someone else, put the armband on, shake somebody's hand, walk off the field, clap to everyone, and then, you know, it's taken two minutes, and then the referee might only add on 30 seconds, so you've wasted some time there. So our research does have implications on how you can actually, you know, try to waste that time at the end of a match. Do you, what do you think it would take for real managers to kind of put a strategy in place based off research like this? Uh, I think it would take them to be A, aware of it. That's often the problem is that they're not necessarily aware of it. And B is for them to actually find a way that they can coach it into players. And I think that's probably the difficult part is to be able to translate into players. You know, you want to tell them, you know, foul, we're going to substitute, take your time when you're going to substitute. It doesn't seem very sportsmanlike, but 
if you consider the difference between Arsenal and Tottenham two, two years ago was one point. If Tottenham had gained that one point, it would have made $30 million more for them in terms of revenue for their team. I think the coaches can say, you know, hey, it's that single point can actually mean a difference in your salary, right? So it is something that maybe players should be able to see as an incentive. And managers should probably consider as how do we get out of a match? And obviously, you don't want to say just foul, 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 but, you know, there's tactics that you can use to try to do this in a smart manner. Now, if a uh, league were to use this information, how would, in your opinion, should they use it to make referees more fair than they are right now? Well, if the league, and often a lot of this research, we talk about monitoring. So the idea is if we're looking at the Premier League is they actually need to monitor referees maybe a little bit more. It's not that they're doing a bad job. It's not that they're doing something horrible and they're changing outcomes of lots of matches. But there is a slight bias there, right? It might only be a couple seconds here and there, but you know that could actually be the difference in getting that point for Tottenham or Arsenal losing one of their points. So we would talk to referees and say, hey, you need to be aware that you know, home or away, you need to be giving the same amount of time. We want to try to create as much fairness because that is the idea is that a home team shouldn't have an advantage in terms of the number of seconds they get at the end of a match. Right. Right. And the last thing I want to talk to you about, you are doing this research with MLS as well. Yes, so our next step is we're actually going to look at Major League Soccer where monitoring of referees is even a newer concept. Um, we know that uh, there's been some significant changes in the league. For example, the penalties taken have pretty much doubled from one year to the next. So that's all because of uh, what the league's been telling people. So we're going to try to collect some data and see if there's a bias that's been included within these changes, like maybe you know the league says you got to give more penalties, well naturally they give them to the home team, or if they give them more extra time and so forth. So we're going to see if there's changes. We don't know if there's any results yet, but that's our next stage in research. All right, well hopefully we'll uh, get to have you back on when you finish up that research and maybe we can take another look and kind of see where it goes for, for MLS as well. Sounds and good. Possible <laughs> U.S. Open Cup as well? Uh, yeah, we're actually thinking about the U.S. Open Cup because it's sort of a natural experiment because we get to see how a upper division team versus a lower division team, will the team that's naturally favored get the better result, will get the better judgments. We saw a lot of red cards for <laughs> NASL teams uh, here in the U.S. Open Cup this year, so I'm sure there's some people out there who would think, you know, there is definitely bias against NASL. The idea is whether we can actually show that within the data or not. So it's not like we're actually saying, oh, we're here to point out that there's bias, but we're just testing to see if there is bias, and if so, in what direction it might exist. Nick Watanabe joins me. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to join me again. Been a lot of criticism <laughs> about MLS referees this year. <laughs> Michael Bradley, the latest on Saturday. So, like I said, hopefully we'll get you back on and talk some MLS. Thanks for having me.